Evening and welcome to the Two Minute Warning. I'm your host, Kerry Busby. Two Minute Warning is brought to you by the Westside Gazette newspaper, one of South Florida's oldest and trusted African American owned newspapers. And sitting next to me, to my right, is my co host and the publisher of the Westside Gazette, my good friend, Bobby Henry. Bobby, how are you doing, my brother? You know, Perry, every time I'm in your company, I like to say I'm terrific and getting better. <laughs> and it's, it's true, man. It's, it's true. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I've come to learn and to know that when men, when true men bond and they create that friendship, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's nothing else like it, man. I mean, nothing you know, like it. Uh, nothing so, like it. So I truly uh, respect and appreciate your friendship. Ship. <laughs> that friendship. <laughs> And, and that's what I, 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 I truly uh, appreciate about uh, you and about our friendship because I I knew only of you and saw you just as a spectator person. I was like, this is someone I really need to know. I mean, because the way you captured the community and captured the essence of where the community stood at that point. Uh, and to tell it forthrightly is uh, I, I, I'm I'm always for stand up guys. And you've always been a stand up guy. So right or wrong, you right or wrong. stand up. I'm gonna stand up. <laughs> you gonna stand up. Thank you. <laughs> you do that, man. It's just so, so much disheartening uh, things happen, man. Uh, these shootings and uh, man, how do we how do how do we do this? How, how how do we address this? I know a lot of folks saying, you know, it's black on black crime and young boys killing in this. You know, uh, I, I've seen uh, a, a gun in itself yeah. kill anybody. <laughs> Not in my history. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, 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 it speaks a lot to where we are. And uh, reminds you of Marvin Gaye. Hmm. Raise up a hand, makes me want to holler. Makes me want to holler. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think where many of us are, I mean, we just want to holler, but, you know, hollering only adds to the mm. <laughs> chaos. So, yeah. You know, we, 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 I was talking to a couple of people, and they and they asked me, well, Bobby, what, 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 what do you think? And, and, I, and I say this, and I'll stand by this. You know, it's, it's not the gun. It's the yeah. mentality behind the gun. You know, we, 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 so many people focus in on, 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 on the, the, uh, the, the gun. Mm. There's many guns on the streets. Too many, you know, uh, black killing blacks. It's just, it's a, man, if we address this, the issue, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah, as I say, nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud, <laughs> man. Nip it in the bud. You know, and, and let's, let's just be truthful about it, man. The, the, the psychic, the, the yeah. mentality that's behind the gun. You know, when, when, when you when you're spewing hatred, uh, and you and you talk about this life is not worth this or right. you know this life is more than you know when we create those dichotomies, man, we we, we get what we get. Yes, and uh, was it? Um, I'm trying to remember where we heard. Someone was saying that, that um, they use the expression that, uh, and I believe it was a teacher. Uh, someone who's or someone who works in the community who said, "Never seen so many soulless children," and that's a well, yeah, that, that's a soulless child. Yes, <clears throat> these are descriptions, <throat> and so they said we we're dealing with children who don't care, and that uh, it, it sounds strong, but but. You know, at some point, we, we got, as I said last week, and my dad keeps reminding me, you can't fix what you don't face. Mm -hmm. and, and and that says something. What, what's going on that our children are feeling? Symptom. Are we, are we afraid to address the issue? 
I, I believe so. Um, well, maybe we don't know this. You know? And so an absence of a solution, let's just get louder. And then you, you can't be heard. You can't right, hear right, right. The noise comes in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, no, man, we're living in interesting times. And, and, and again, to put that against, as you said, I'm terrific and getting better. I agree with you. I'm terrific and getting better. And that's not to say we're displaced from this. No. You know, no. and uh, because it, it, it hit its and, and so that's always the position that I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. It's never a them, it's, it's an us. It's an us. Now, I'm going to use this analogy, and, and please, I, I, I want the viewers and the listeners to understand what I'm about to say. You know, look past uh, what I'm saying and envision uh, what I'm talking about. There, there's a rose that grows in a sewer. Okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. a rose, a beautiful rose that grows in a sewer. Now, if you can imagine this rose, its, its roots are so deep uh, that it grows beneath the sewage. And the stem that has the rose never really gets in the sewage. Mm -hmm. It stays above. So no matter no matter if if we're in the the doodle, mm -hmm. we don't have to become the doodle, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and 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 that's so easy uh, because uh, I think if you look at any leader in history, Dr. King, uh, uh, Malcolm, they they all dealt with the people that they were helping, not understanding them. And, and that's hard uh, when people are being critical of their leaders uh, unknowingly mm -hmm. and, and picking the side of their oppressor because it's, it's easy, hmm. you know? And so we, uh, you know, I, I, I think we as leaders uh, have to always put it in perspective, you know? Um, Let's quit pointing at us. We are, we, as uh, Obama said, we are the change we're looking for, and I believe in that. Okay, and I see our viewers are chiming in already. Brother Darrell Hope says, uh, Perry in the Bible, it speaks of uh, uh, there will be a time uh, when our children will be fearless. And he says, we're in those times. Mm -hmm. and Mr. Wesley Boyd, and he, he said, you want to know the truth, go where? Go to stop. stop the crime. Crime. Have you ever visited that, that site? No, I haven't. Me either. No. Mm -hmm. or, or is he? Uh, you know, I, I, but but we do have to stop. The crime. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that's an actual site or whatever. But uh, again, uh, yeah, we 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 have to be responsible for our neighborhoods, and I and I don't think that we uh, we aren't. I just don't think that we have a strategy. Mm hmm. You know, we, we, we don't for, for what we're facing. And, and, you know, but we have shows like this. We welcome your input. Uh, we're looking for solutions, not just here to talk about the problems, you're looking for solutions. So, um, you know, yeah. please listen, offer solutions, offer critiques. We're here for you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what we got? And well, you know, I'm speaking, we're speaking about uh, basically mental health. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, our mental health will basically dictate to where we go. Mm -hmm. you know, be it stand and deal with it, mm -hmm. tuck your tail and run, right. or cop out of suicide. Mm -hmm. It's all about dealing with our mental health, leadership, candidates who run for office, it's about mental health. So as we uh, segue into the show, our, our guest, our first guest is uh, Miss Lynn Shaw, Miss Lynette Butler Shaw, who is uh, the founder and chief executive officer of the Lynn Shaw Group. Now, that in itself doesn't tell you a whole lot about this person. Her life experiences uh, would, 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 would give you a better 
picture of who she is uh, outside of all the things that she has achieved. Uh, one of them being uh, one of the the what, what the award winning bounty hunter, uh, I think three or four times, three or four years in a row, um, a police officer, uh, mental health psychologist. Uh, I mean, she's she's been through it all. So I won't belittle belittle mm -hmm. this issue. I'll just let's just bring on let's bring on Miss Lynette. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. How are you, Miss Shaw? I am wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful and so happy uh, to be here with you tonight. Mm -hmm. well, let's get right into it. I, I met Miss Lynette uh, through a friend and uh, over the phone, never laid eyes on her. Uh, it was concerning an event and maybe she'll talk about the event later on. But what struck me the most was who this person was and where she came from. So Lynette, you 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 mind telling us a little bit about it? Absolutely. So um, you know my name. Um, I'm from uh, Patterson, New Jersey, and currently um, it the murder cap one one of the murder capitals of uh, of our of our country. Uh, it, there's a whole lot of killing going on um, in our country, and it's and it's us. Um, and so grew up in the hood, Patterson, New Jersey, and in a one parent, basically one parent um, home. And my mom worked three jobs and, uh, and I'm the light skinned child in a black, black family and have it that, uh, you know, had, had those little nuances because the rest of my family's brown skin, basically. Um, and, you know, I, I experienced a great deal of trauma living where I lived. Um, and I, I will tell you a little bit about uh, how uh, my life be began. And it's much, very much like some other young people that are out here now. Um, but I do have a unique story uh, and my mom, three jobs, and my uncles were all Black Panthers. And I had one that took me to school every morning. And this particular morning, um, I'm, I'm a little fresh little girl at seven years old. And I decide that I'm not going to, I'm, go, I'm not going to school that day. But my uncle dropped me off at school and he left. And everybody's in the playground, getting ready to go into the school. And my little behind backs out of, of the playground under this little trailer that was out there. They were fixing the school. And I backed out into uh, under, under that trailer and to be grabbed by six white boys from um, a neighboring school dragged into a building across the street, tied up, raped, and left for dead at seven years old. I bit through the rope that I was tied, that was tied to my arms, and walked, got out and walked home. I got into the bed, and by the time my mom got home around nine at night, um, she came in to see me and I had 105 fever. And back in the day, they, didn't, they weren't taking you to no hospital. They were gonna rub you down with alcohol and, and, and make sure you, they get the fever down. But she never um, looked under the covers. And as a seven year old child that was playing hooky, um, I never said a word. And so I endured that trauma and my behavior actually changed in school um, and nobody saw me. Nobody saw that my behavior changed, uh, not a principal, not a teacher, not a security guard. I, I, I started to fight with other kids 
that were messing with other kids. I was trying to beat up all the bullies. Anybody that was messing with somebody, I started, you know, fighting and trying to defend them. And so that's just one, um, the way it started. So my dad um, was a bail bondsman in the, in the town, very well known. And um, I worked in the office after school. And so by the age of 11, my dad was taking me to the jail to bail people out. Um, locals, people from New York, people from, you know, drug dealers, drug people that were really into drugs, um, bad. But the families would come to my dad's office to bail them out. So my little 11 year old behind, I'm, I'm there taking applications and, and um, I learned Spanish a little bit. So I was able to you know, take the application in Spanish for those families, who, Spanish families who came. But mostly it was black families because of black neighborhood, black, you know, um, and, and sprinklings of Dominican and Puerto Rican and whatnot. So um, I got real close with the families. And so um, one day the police officers came over from across the street looking for people that we bailed out. Um, saying, you know, what what information do you have on them? My dad used to take me to the jail and I used to take pictures of the people we bailed out. And so I would be able to talk to the families and everything, take that information. And what I didn't know at the time is that I had a uh, photographic memory. Uh, when the officers came over, uh, they said they were talking to my dad, whose name was Lenny. These are the people we looking for and I'm nosy. So I'm looking over and I'm like, well, I know where he is. He is and he is. And and the officers were like, get out of here. And I said, I know where they are. And so uh, they asked, Lynn, can we borrow your daughter? And he said, yes. They put me in the back of the car at 11 years old. I took them to the armory where I knew all of those guys hang out. And there were two officers in an unmarked car and me in the back seat. And I said, there's that one and there's that one, right? And they both jumped out the car. The car was rolling. And you, I know everybody here remember the seat. I had jump over the seat and put the car in, in, in gear and jump back in the back seat. And so I did that. Here they come with both these dudes with their arms behind their back. And one on one side of me, one on the other side of me. And they were like, Lynette, what's going on? And I said, well, you didn't go to court. Uh, you missed the court date. And said, well, I didn't get a notice, they said. And I said, well, if you didn't get a notice, I'm going to talk to my dad. And I'm going to have him go into court and vacate the warrant. Because if you didn't get the notice, they sent it to the wrong address. And sure enough, both of them, they sent it to the wrong address and talked to my dad. My dad went in, vacated the warrants, and they got out right away. From that one time, those dudes went out on the street and said, listen, if you got any trouble, make sure you call Lenny's daughter. And so word went out on the street that make sure they call me, and Lord, they were calling me. So by the age of 18, years old. I, I went out with those officers. They pretty much taught me everything from the age of 11, 12, 13. 14. They shouldn't have had me out there. But back in the day, it was what they did. By the age of 18, um, I had my own fugitive squad and I ran an eight man squad. Um, and we would go all over the country and I, I got really good at fugitive investigations, mainly because I established relationships in the in the neighborhood. And back in the day, mothers, single mothers that worked real hard would have homes that they put up for those kids to get them out of jail. And their homes were in jeopardy. And so they would come to me and say, Lynette, I can't lose my home. I worked all my life for this home. And can you go get them? I know that they're going to come home okay. If you got to put him in jail, it's okay. But I'm going to tell you where he is. And, and so 
I had those types of relationships with the people because they knew me from the age of 11 years old. And so by the age of 22, um, I had news reporters following me around. I was bringing in over 400 people in a year and unheard of with anybody, right? But I was, I was acting crazy. I was running, jumping roof to roof, running after people, jumping on dudes that were six, nine, and uh, just, just really a mess. Now, everybody wanted to work with me. Uh, she's so cool. She, you know, I, she got my back. I got, you know, I can't believe that she jumped on that guy. They're all impressed with the craziness that I was doing to bring these people in. And meanwhile, I, they didn't know, and I didn't know at the time that I was absolutely suicidal. Uh, it, uh, the stuff that had happened to me prior, and, and let me go back a minute. Um, in my household, my dad was present, but not living with us. And I watched my mom be beaten in every which way you could think of, thrown out of a moving vehicle, almost drowned in front of me, guns in places that children should never see, guns being put on their mom and then I was beaten um, as well. And so I did not have, I really didn't have a, a, a childhood. And at the age of seven, when my dad would call um, and I knew he was coming, I'd be like, come on, ma. And I found a way down the railroad tracks to get us to a, my grandmother's house. And while my mother was all beaten up and crying, um, I'd be pulling her down the railroad tracks and the bee guys on the side of the railroad tracks that were homeless and, and they get up and try to get us. And I'll tell my mom, just run, just run. And I'll pick up the rocks on the side and throw them at the guy. And I said every cuss word, I think I made up cuss words, um, calling those guys and, and, and telling them what I was going to do to them, but throwing rocks at them and stuff and making my mom run. And that was at age seven. I have been a defender. <laughs> of innocent folk my entire life. And, and someone uh, asked me recently, Lynette, who's ever protected you? And, and it, I had to get real quiet because I don't know anybody that ever has. So fast forward, um, yeah. Uh, America's top bounty hunter is a girl. All these newspaper articles that went all over the world. I mean, to, in Europe, uh, New York, just on the front of the uh, New York Post, America's top bounty hunter was a, is a girl. Everybody glamorizing this young girl who just does amazing things. And yet that young girl was, was suicidal. Um, didn't even you know, didn't, didn't even occur to them that something was wrong um, because it didn't seem to them, you know, they were excited by what we were doing. And so, you know, that, that path, I did that for 13 years. And, um, and then once those newspaper articles came out, I felt like they blew my cover. And so, I moved to Europe for a little while, lived in London, lived um, on the east coast of Africa on an island called Seychelles for a while, um, and moved around, went to Germany and, and stayed in, in Nuremberg, Germany for a while, um, and then came back and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, I took a police test, passed the police test, and I went to the first police department that called me. Um, and, you know, they immediately, they recognized um, my skills. So they put me in the detective bureau. So that, that's just a small, um, you know, just, just a little bit of, of, of my life. Um, what I didn't tell you before, I, I was married at the age of 26. And I was married to a, a, a boxer. Um, his name is Todd Hickman. And he was in the Russian Olympics with Mike Tyson, and um, he 
he was in the newspapers all over the place saying he's going to be the next Sugar Ray Leonard. And we were married for one year. Um, and I lived in Akron, Ohio at the time. And before that year was out, um, my husband was shot in the head, in the back of the head and killed. And so, um, again, another spiral and I'm not dealing with any of this stuff. Um, and I'm fully on the police department um, after all of this. And I'm doing a stalking panel uh, and sitting on a panel with a prosecutor and a couple of other people. And um, the prosecutor, unbeknownst to me, brought a audio tape with them. And it was a 911 call. They were trying to, you know, um, uh, display. It was 200 students in the room. And the audio tape came on and it said, please help me. It was a little girl's voice. And in that moment, something cracked open inside of me. And right there on that panel, I start seeing me tied down, all kinds of other traumas that I went through and just flashes of it. And I sat there, I answered three more questions from those students. And I ran out of there and got in my car and started screaming because I didn't know what was happening. I thought that I was losing my mind. I was getting these flash flashes of different things that happened to me. And I guess it was so buried that everything just came up at once. And, and I got home, I got in the shower and wouldn't get out the shower. And I, thank God a friend got me to a counselor. And that was the beginning of me even recognizing or acknowledging what had happened to me and why I was doing any and all the stuff that I even chose to do, um, being the protector. And when I, I just found out recently that um, many police officers and people that do helps, pastors, um, uh, firefighters and whatnot, many of them have been through things um, that where they have been traumatized and hurt. And that's why they choose those professions because they try to act out trying to, they're, they're trying to save their younger self through doing that job. And it makes so much sense to me when I, you know, when a psychologist told me that I was like, that's the reason I became a police officer. Because in the beginning, I really didn't even like police officers. My, my uncles were Black Panthers, so I saw a lot of things happen in the community that I thought were so unfair and not right. And then I knew some really good police officers, but then I, I, I also knew some that were not so good. And so I decided that I was going to do something from the inside um, and make some changes from the inside and that I would respect folks because I always had good relationships with the community, whether they were drug dealers or, or you know, any, any illegal activity or, or otherwise. Um, because many people don't know why folks get in to these things. You know, back in the day, they used to send, you know, us to police officers and say, you know what, can you talk to my son or can you talk to my daughter? Not anymore. There's no more respect like that because they did away with community policing. They did away with, you know, things that really bring bring them together, you know. Um, and so I decided I'm going to do something about it. And um, throughout my career, I've had the awesome opportunity um, to train police officers in how to de-escalate situations and how to recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness in young people or in people in general. So instead of going to their guns, they they can talk and they'll recognize that it's because it's a black person is is and they're angry doesn't mean they're dangerous. It means that they're angry. <laughs> you know, and, and oftentimes um if you don't come from a neighborhood, you don't know our culture, how we roll. Um 
uh, Puerto Rican folk that talk with their hands, you know, and so that might be misconstrued. Sometimes we get loud and that may be misconstrued as aggressive and, and whatnot, but we're upset. And so I, I have had the opportunity to change some a lot of police officers' perspective by teaching them about culture and, and also about mental illness and how those symptom, symptoms can present. And that has saved so many lives, so many lives. A uh, police officer um, that I trained said one thing to me that stuck out and it was so significant to me. And I realized the brevity of, of what I was doing when he said that. He said, Lynette, I'm on a SWAT team. You train my whole team. He said, last year, I had 60 mental health calls. He said, guess how many I shot? And I said, he said, not one. He said, you are saving lives. He says, I'm one police officer that you trained and that got it. Imagine, he said, how many police officers did you train? I said, 10,000. How many lives do you think that you have affected? And that hit me in a way that, you know, I never thought I was doing so much. Um, and, and I realized that it is an important work to be done. Um, so, I, you know, I also teach young people um, in the community, inner city kids, those with bracelets uh, that have been to jail and whatnot. I teach them about mental health and that they're worthy, that they don't have to stay where they are or they're not, they are not what they did. Um, so many times our kids are just trodden down on because they made mistakes, like we never made mistakes, right? And many times because of the actions, they don't, they're not acknowledged, they're forgotten. They, you know, you don't know what's going on in their homes. Nobody knew what was going on in my home. And so you look and you say, you, we point fingers at young people, but we don't know what they've been through. We don't know what's going on in the home. And, and if they have anybody that, that is there that even cares about them. And so just to touch young people and let them know where you've been and that, you know what, if, if, if I could get through and, and I only told you this much of my story. If I can come through that and, and, and have been traumatized in the way that I have been traumatized, then anybody, anybody can come out of it. Well, you know, I, you know we did a lot of shows. I don't think we've ever, I don't think we've ever said this way, you know, and, and, and not to get something. Um, you know, you know, uh, Miss Miss Michelle, to be able, and, and I think uh, a, a lot of leaders should, but to be able to overcome situations where you have, have had no control, and to be able to, and, and you've been victimized, and to be able to come out of that to become a leader to teach, says in itself uh, that that there is. There is hope, you know, in, in, in humans, in us as humans. But we have to find that. How, how, how do we get to that point? How did you overcome uh, uh, the, the, the trauma to be able to go out and now heal? Well, I, I will tell you that healing is a process. He, he, healing is definitely a process. Let me see. And, and I will tell you that therapy totally changed my life. With black folks, I, I don't know about, you know, where I come from and where my family come from, North Carolina and Virginia, you know, the, 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 what we heard all the time from my grandmother, my great grandmother, you know what child, whatever goes on in the house stays in the house. So, it, so it's encouraged that we keep those things that go on our home secret and, and down through the years that has hurt us as black folks. It has hurt us because we always loyal to the things that is not helping us. 
that tear us down. To talk about it is healing. To tell somebody you can you can you can come out of that. Um, but we're embarrassed about therapy, embarrassed about getting help. Black women always got to be strong. We always got to do things on our own and whatnot. We don't need this and we don't need that. We do. We need community. We need family. And, and, and I'm talking about functional family, not the dysfunctional family. We need family. We need community. And we need to know that it's okay. We, uh, many people have been through things. And therapy works. Now, it's not one size fit all. And so th that, you know, people are intimidated or they don't want to go because they think maybe the therapist doesn't know their plight or hasn't been where they've been and stuff. And so I'm, I'm here to say that I've been to several therapists and not one of them were bad. Not one of them for me. And I think that was the grace of God, number one. But because I needed to get healed, I needed to have healing because I just believe that God knew where he was sending me. And so I need to be healed so that I can speak my truth and so that others can be healed or they'll have the courage to at least talk about um, what they have been through and, and somebody will be there to navigate that process with them. I don't believe in doing things for people per se. I believe in I, I believe in teaching people how to fish, not giving them the fish because you have to empower our people, not not make them dependent on you. And so that's one of the things that I I, I really love that I've always done. I've not made people rely on me, but I can stir them in the right direction and teach them how to you know recognize those symptoms within themselves and 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 come to the realization that i need help i need help i'm angry all the time i fight all the time i you know i need help it's okay to need help you know what one, one of the viewers and, and this glory you lewis i uh, i really appreciate this now, now she's not saying that that our show uh, Sheriff Gregory Tony has any mental problems, but her question says, she said, Bobby, she is awesome, me and you. What can we do to help our Sheriff Gregory Tony with all the drama uh, around him? Now, now, I guess, not, not that I guess, when you when you were in a high-profile uh, position and, 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 and there are those who don't want you in that position, and all all this stuff comes that has to have an effect on, on some folk uh, mentality. Yes. What can we do, or what can, as as Miss Lewis says, what can 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 we help our ship? I think that this is it's a tough position to be in when you are in a position of power and 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 you have people around you that are jealous, people that that want to take you down because, it, you know, many times they, um, folks don't want us in certain positions because it's too much power. But what I want to say is encourage, encouraging one another and being there, even if it's just to listen and, and not get in, into all of the, what he say, she say, all of that kind of stuff to perpetuate what other folks are doing, we need to stand firm and support one another. We really need to stand firm. And that's something that, you know, I, I haven't seen in, in us. Um, other folks stick together, but I feel like many, where I've been, it's been crabs in a bucket, right? It's, it's one, one gets on top and you pulling this one down and you pulling that one down and you pulling that one down. And, and, it, it's, it's sad that when you get leaders, um, it, it, it takes a big, big toll on your mental health. And so you need to encourage one another and to be there and not to add to, you know, talking about the situation. All that's doing is stirring things up. 
And then people got ideas about, oh, did he do this? Did that? I, I, I don't think that's our position to judge. I think God is 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 the only is the only judge. Uh, I I know we're we're running out of time, but I do have this one question for you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your story is powerful. Um, you said something. You said that as a child, no uh, uh, no one recognized. And I want to go back to that because. As a child going back, is it just that no one asked uh, what's going on? And from that experience, how have you taken that experience and applied it to kids today? Because I think you know, that that's a powerful statement that people just saw something, but no one. No one from saw you, your perspective. I, you I, no I, I still feel like no. You know, like no nobody really saw me, and and it's much like that today. That you look at the kids' behavior, right? But you don't under you don't look for the underlying reason. Wait a minute, that child wasn't like that before. You know, they look at the behavior, and they're scolding the behavior, and it's not the behavior that's the problem. It's what's under that behavior, and oftentimes they say our children can't learn. It's not true. Remove that trauma and take that off and watch our children soar. The problem is, is that we are all looking at behavior. And I listen to young people. They listen to me and I listen to them. And I take my time and I see them. I can see under all of that. I can see under the, the angry child or the one that I hate police officers or I hate this and I hate that. There is something wrong there. There's something that they've experienced and they have all of that on top of who they really are. And too often, more often than not, we're not seeing that. We're just looking at what they do and and, and not who they are. Michelle, <clears throat> we have to have you back. Uh, so we can we can we can go the further because of the work that you're doing. Now now you and I had a conversation earlier, and and and, and you you you're involved with something that's coming up. You know, yes. Can you mention a little bit about that? Yes, it's moment of silence. It's it's um, a, an organization that is a nonprofit, and they try to help get rid of the stigma and police suicide. And so we are having an event in Davie, Florida on, on, on the 30th, uh, Friday, and we will be uh, bringing other police officers from, uh, there was a guy who, who ran in and saved 150 children in Uvalde, um, Jacob, and we're bringing him in, we're giving him an award. A couple of officers from Doral who were in a firefight um, and they survived it. Um, we're giving them an award and, and trying to just uplift those who are doing a really good job um, and, and to bring to light the suicide that is happening in the, in the police community. And so that event will be on September 30th. And we also, just so you know, any, any viewers who wanted to attend, I'd be willing to give two tickets. It's a hundred, they're $150 ticket and it's lobster and, 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 a, a a uh, lobster and and steak dinner, and, and a full full bar. So um, if anybody's interested in going, um, I'll have two comp tickets for the person. You know, two people who want to go. Thank you. It's moment of silence. <laughs> okay, okay. And and, and Miss Shaw, we will have uh, we have another guest waiting in the, in the backstage. But I want to say this. Uh, we were trying to create uh, this show and how to bring some healing in this political season. Uh, we've seen how politics uh, are, are, are destroying people and, and, and each other. Yes. So uh, we said that we would do this. And, and uh, every leader or every, anybody to be a leader has to have his or her mental capacity at its at its utmost 
you know, uh, yes. and, and so, so you you have set the stage, uh, hopefully, for 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 those who are are, are aspiring for the position of leadership to understand that that the mind first of all is a terrible thing waste, and our survival is dependent upon uh, our psychological and well-being in what we do. Yes. So. Uh, you very much for, for setting the stage and Mr. thank Blake. you for having me that's great thank you Mr. but you you, you, you can come back and I, I hope somebody responds to those two tickets uh i won't be here if i was i would respond to those two tickets <laughs> i would love for them, to, for them to join me thank you so much for this opportunity and god bless you both thank you thank you god bless you thank you Okay. <clears throat> oh, man, that was, uh, yeah, it's just a powerful story. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's just to listen and get a good perspective. And uh, wow, what a powerful story. Okay. So is our next guest, is she, is she back there? Yes, our next guest uh, is no stranger to the show. Uh, she was here a few months ago uh, to speak with us. Uh, she's a candidate for the Broward County School Board District 5. Uh, that race ended in a runoff, uh, and the two top candidates were uh, our guests, uh, Ruth Carter Lynch, as well as uh, Jill Holdness. And uh, so we're happy to have uh, Ms. Lynch to join us tonight. And uh, just for uh, the sake of public record, we did reach out to both candidates. Uh, we've not heard from Mr. Holness, but uh, again, thank you for joining us, Ms. Lynch. And uh, welcome once again. Well, thank you, and it's always it's always a pleasure to be here with you all. And I wasn't. Uh, hot to trot because the topic, the mental health topic is so, so important. It is one of the most important topics of our time right now, especially with our children. And, you know, when we talk about our children, when we talk about education in our schools, we cannot be lost on the fact that our educators and our administrators, our cafeteria workers, our bus drivers, they're all filling the pinch of the mental health issue. So we, we have to do whatever we can. And trust me, I understand trauma. I, I was born and raised in Greenwood, Mississippi, and that's enough said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got a diploma on dealing with certain people, right? <laughs> yeah, trust me. I have a PhD in trauma, right? Yeah. But, yeah. and that old saying, I think every, no matter what black household you came from, uh, my grandmother would say house business is house business. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like the, the doctor said, uh, the psychologist said, we have been programmed both uh, directly and subliminally not to talk about trauma, especially trauma that happens in our house and around our kids. You know, I've, and I've, I myself and uh, quite a few other people I know, we I have, I had I, at the, the ripe old age of twelve I was molested, mm -hmm. and it was by a, a family member. So and you know of course we couldn't talk about that, but the only thing that healed me, and I and I never tell people to get over stuff. I tell people to get through it. Mm -hmm. The only thing that healed me was the fact that I had I went into therapy for five years after I became an adult. Because what happens is you, uh, <clears throat> you that stuff let, lies dormant in, your, in the back of your mind. And, it, and it, anything can trigger it. And you don't have any control of how you react to that trigger. But in order to make it through everything, you just kind of bury it uh, until you really have forced to deal with it. So trust me, when it comes to mental health, we have to really, 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 really be diligent. And, and especially with our kids, every time I pick up, uh, I'm t I can't even read the paper anymore because we're having so many suicides. 
by our children. Suicides are at an epidemic level right now among school-aged children. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, what do they have to be worried about? Life. You know, life happens when we're not watching. But, oh, go ahead, Bobby. You are going to say something. Well, I must say they do have to worry about. Um, and, and they are because I, I think, you know, it's more adults who are sort of who are right so dealing with this mental illness and one being the fact that somehow we think our children are not seeing what we are doing and, and, and are not coming to some conclusions about what they see what we're doing and uh, right now our school board uh, is going through quite a few changes some rightfully so uh, but regardless, it is in chaos, yep. and it's going to take cool heads and well-level thinking uh, to help steer us out of this. And you know, if there was ever a time uh, of constant mental health among leaders in a critical time, it's now. Um, help, help us. Understand. What's going on with the race? Oh, what's going on with my race? The community level talk. Well, let let me just tell you, I, I have a good report. I, I really have a good report. I was able to uh, do something that I don't know whether it has been done before in Broward County, but, uh, and I have to give the credit to my, my husband, Pastor Robert Lynch. Because you know, once you come out of a race, and if you didn't come out on top, you have to go. You have to go lick your wounds for a little bit. And if anybody tell you that they're not disappointed when it's not what they expected, they're not telling the truth. So, but Pastor Lynch said, "Why don't you do this? Why don't you go ahead and call all of your past opponents, and we'll invite them to brunch, and let's sit down and have a conversation and strategize how we're going to do this political thing going forward." Let's face it, everybody know I'm, I, I personally don't want to be in office forever. It's time for us to train and groom the next generation to step into our shoes once we've done what we, as much as we can do. I am a strong proponent of, of and, and it bothers me that every time a young person or anybody come into office, they have to start over from the beginning. Why is that? I am in office and I have all of, all of the access. Why can't I give that access to the next generation and personally introduce them to the process? And that's one of the things that I plan to do once I'm elected. And you know, at the end of the day, that is so that is so important and so necessary because we have to let them know that we actually care. And both of you guys are God fearing men, I'm sure. And Bobby, you know, the Bible probably as good much as I do. I had to learn it because I'm married to a pastor. That's another story. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. I'm a priest here, so I, I don't know. <laughs> it, is our, it is our job yeah. to train and foster and mentor uh, the next generation. That's our job. You know, you know, and, 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 and Ms. Ms. Lynch, the the I, I, I must commend what what you what you did, you and your husband and, and the other four candidates, and, and to those who didn't make it, shame on them. Uh, the, the thing that gets me, and, and you know me, you know, I'm gonna tell you what I, what I feel. I I, I think. You know, you guys took a picture. That that's good. But I want to see, I want to see you come together, and I want to see those folk endorse you. I mean, we can't, we can't, we don't endorse for the show. But mm -hmm. to, to, to those who who met, I, I I think it's time for us to say, okay, if 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 we can do this, and I'm with you, I'm gonna tell the world I'm with you. You know, because mm -hmm. that would that would allow others to see their those people who supported them. Now uh, the fact that they have come out and support you that means something you know and and, and i don't want to i don't want to uh, editorialize but, mm -hmm. but but we we have to start standing up and telling the truth yes you know, i mean yeah 
<laughs> well, I'll that, tell you, that, they, and that, that's not only me, they've been working with me uh, continuously, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they plan to, and they will tell people, people have asked them, who are they supporting? And they will tell people that they're supporting me, but I get your point. We're going to have an opportunity to do all of that. Uh, I am having, uh, 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 well, I don't want to say a team meeting and a fundraiser at Smitty's on October the 4th. And I'm going to make sure you guys get a, an invitation to that. And I've asked the, all of them to come too, and they're, they're going to be there. So you get a, we'll get a chance to, do, to talk and, 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 and fellowship and, and, and strategize and come up with a plan that's going to work for the entire community and especially for our children. Yeah, we don't need the same old, same old, you know, and, and, and yeah. Carrie, you were alluding to our, our, our school board and its uh, uh, lack of, of, what do you call it? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, we definitely have a school board. Had, I mean, they're coming back, I'm sorry. No, what, oh, play, play, play. But I'm, I'm saying what we're dealing with, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, in terms of it, in terms of the direction of our educational system, uh, I think that the fight that we're fighting, I mean, us and the African American community and maybe those of Democrats is very different than what Republicans are fighting. Mm -hmm. and, and and so if you're in a different fight, I, I'm just sort of saying, well, what is the strategy against what I see they're doing? Because they're creating coalition, their ultimate goal is really some crazy idea of getting rid of, the of education. Mm -hmm. Hell, we just trying to get good schools. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, how how is that fight for what, what we're fighting for? Is that short sighted against what what we're fighting of against? I mean, because now we are, we almost have a uh, we are, we have a governor that's almost superintended by the factor. I mean, he he sort of. Well, you know, one thing that we have to do, see, sometimes we, 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 um, for the lack of a better word, we fall asleep at the wheel. Oh, Lord and, have mercy. You must read my, did you read my article? Huh? You must no, read. I did not. No, I did not. I, we probably had the same dream, you and I, <laughs> the same dream or the same nightmare, but either way you want to look at it. Uh, we, we've been asleep at the wheel for a long time. And, you know, I know, trust me, I get it. DeSantis is interesting, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if we don't go out to vote, everything that we're doing as far as trying to get change things and make things better, is an exercise in futility, if you ask me. You know, we well, can't. Can, 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 can we flip that question? Because, because again, we have, uh, and I, I agree, let, 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 I'm not saying that because of this, but let's also look at this. You're, you're right, we need to vote, but you also have people who are saying, well, hell, I've been voting and this is what we got. Tell me what's different. And that's a, I mean, it, it, it sounds illogical, but that's where they are. And again, we're dealing with mental health. And if we can't but acknowledge- we have to wake up though. Come on, come on, uh, uh, Perry. Everybody, everybody is dealing with mental health. We are no different than anybody else, okay? We, have, we just have to wake up, okay? And grow up. Because I mean, you know, first of all, we are not, we can't wait for anybody else to do it. You know, the only people that's going to save us is us. And we've got to come up with a strategy and figure out how we're going to do that together. Now, it's going to take some time, Perry. I get it. Absolutely. Because guess what? We didn't get this way overnight. So we've got to come get together, come together, strategize, come up with a plan of action. And let's just face it. Everybody's not going to want to come along, but those that want to come, we need to diligently work with them as much as we possibly can. And let's get back to the school board. 
sometimes stuff has to be torn up to be fixed up. Say that again, Ruth. I missed that. Say that one more time. I said sometimes things have to be torn up to be fixed up. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's that Mississippi and then you coming up. Yeah, that's what that is. Right. That's exactly what that is. And, you know, we weren't allowed not to mm -hmm. to to do what we needed to do. We weren't we didn't have time to. And, we, and then another thing we weren't allowed to do, we weren't allowed to not take care of our neighbors and to take care of other people. We weren't allowed to try to go up there by ourselves because I was told every chance they got that you're not at this college because you did anything spectacular. You're there because we all got together and made sure you got to go. And for that, you owe it to the community and the black race to do the best you can and bring everybody along that you can. Ruth, let me ask you this. Now, to those who, who may say, well, we got a school board of a bunch of Republicans. So how do you deal? How do you deal with that? Well, how I deal with that is it's okay. The man, the man with the with the keys to the gates uh, opens it and closes it. Then that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, the board board. The, I'm a board governance trainer. I know what the board's job is, regardless of who's sitting there. I've got to work with whoever is there and build consensus for the good of the children. You know, I can't just be mad. And when you just mad, you get nothing done. I've got to be on my game. I've got to understand what's necessary. I've got to go in there and deal with that budget. And I have to understand, make sure that the superintendent understands that she works for the board and we don't work for her. And we have to hold her feet to the fire to do what's necessary to bring this school back into the, the what we know it can be. Broward County is the sixth largest school district in the nation. And it has some phenomenal programs. We just, we're going through a transition. And it's, it's in, incumbent upon me to understand what my community needs and for me to go there and fight for that with everything in my power to do that. Because, you know, I was asked a question just recently uh, that I, that I, it was said that I said that um, uh, the Broward County, the District 5 didn't have rep good representation. That's not what I said. So I have to, I had to correct that. What I said was, and I continue to say it, that Broward County, that District 5 has been underserved for the last 30 or 40 years. And I meant that. And let me tell you what, why I say that. I went out west on purpose and I go visit these schools all around because you have to know, you don't know what you want unless you go see where it is. We have some state of the art schools in other parts of this county. And with it, they're still getting resources. And I'm, my question is, how come that hasn't happened over here? And that's the question I'm going to be asking, and that's what I'm going to be fighting for as soon as it, but the first day on that board is to have these resources put in the place where they need to be. So somebody from District 4 told me, District 4 don't need anything. But then on the flip side, I heard at one of the school board meetings, one of the school board members was requesting uh, a, a cafeteria or something, a new something. And I'm saying, are you kidding me? I think that we should well, take that. Just, I, and, and again, I'm asking because I, and I agree with you. Huh? Uh, but this is about numbers. Yes. And, and, and so it was a, and, in order for that district to get that, there had to be a at least a five-four decision on right that approval, right? Well, you know, here's there had the to be a four-four decision on that approval, right? Wait, 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 wait. Now, see, that's where you when you're talking about building I'm not, I'm not making an 
pregnant. I'm asking well, because no, 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 I, no, no, I get it. Yeah. But here's well, here's what I'm saying to you is though, yeah, there's a five four vote. But you, but you, if you're on top of your game, everybody on that board needs something, and they're gonna eventually need something from you. So what you do is you make sure that you count your votes. And let's face it, going into this, because by the way, it's only going to be one appointee. And I think that's going to be Tori Austin from DeSantis in November. So that little that situation is going to be uh, not there after November. OK. So it's, it's going to be back. Uh, I think it'd be only one known Republican, I'm just going to say that at this point, on their board, and that's Tory, uh, the chair. But at the end of the day, we have three school board members. Every district has three school board members. You have two at large, and you have one district person. That elim that takes down my two, the two, I only need two more votes, Perry. And I've got to do what I need to do to make sure I get those two votes to get what I want for my district. Need a vote. It's not you, you need a vote. It's we need a vote. And that, oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And let me turn this checks, this checks board around. Uh-huh. You my chess piece. Right. I need, we need some other chess pieces. I don't need a chess piece that I got to put in and fight with everything after I have gone through an election cycle and put obstacles in your way. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the numbers game that I'm saying we're losing. Well, because I'm we'll, come back and we'll, we'll put four contentious people at a board seat and fight for crumbs, and and the budget keeps getting approved because all we're doing is following the process. Well, you know, and like it's I said. Yeah, and it's not uh, names, it's not it's not parties, it's how this system has been played. I, and it I has agree. been for our advantage. And when it has been given some advantages to us, it has come from people who have sought to see their piece of the pie before it got to the rest of the people. This is the game that we're and this is the game that we keep trying to act like the people on the street don't see. Because that's the same rule that they play by. But let me say this to you, Perry. It's all about what your personal agenda is when you go there. Right. My only agenda is to make sure that the children and the District 5 schools get the tools necessary to get, to get a great education. Student achievement is so important now. It is extremely important. And they can't, and the, the teachers can't teach unless we give them the tools necessary to do that. And one of the things we're talking about, you said is about the money. It is. It's so much waste in that budget, Perry. <clears throat> if we can uh, streamline some of that waste, and that's part of what my, I'm, I'm a Lean Six Sigma green belt. And what that means is I'm uh, certified to go in and find waste and eliminate it. If we can get rid of some of that waste, we can take that money and we can reallocate it properly to make sure that we, the people that's needed the most can get it, get that those funds. So those, those are the things that we have to do. You just have to be ready. And to your point earlier, we have to do the work. We have to do our due diligence. You know, I'm not looking for a job. I don't need a job, by the way. I am there to work and to change the trajectory of what's been happening in District 5 and to assist the young, the next generation in acquiring the access without having to start all over again. That's my agenda. Okay, I, my, my, okay let me ask you this. <clears throat> uh, I almost said Dr. Ruth. <laughs> okay. uh, now, a, a good strategist, a good coach, knows uh, uh, the team that he's playing. He, he or she has studied it, watched film, and, and, and knows the weaknesses and the strengths. From where you sit, 
your opponent, uh, 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 what do you, you see as a strength and a weakness from him? So, pardon me? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. What, what did you, you say? What do you see as a strength uh, and a weakness of your opponent? And how do you address that? Well, first of all, um, the uh, uh, first of all, Bobby, I don't, I never like to give my opponent free press, but I'm going to add answer that question. Whenever you call your opponent's name, you're giving them free press. But in any event, to answer your question, I know, I know my community. I spent the last 22 years working in this community, in District Five, with our children, with the community and doing, making things happen without even having a title. So that's one of the weaknesses that my, my opponent don't know this community. Not like I know it. I don't have to go and find, and I don't have to go in and find new friends. I know where to go to get what I need from this community. And I know how to rally this community to come on board for us to help our kids together. So that's the weakness. Okay. okay. Now I, I see it's getting okay. Sure, Dicky said no said Miss Ruth. <laughs> Dara Hope says Miss Lynch, this issue concerning our children goes beyond hope. There is a plot and a political conspiracy going on against the lives of our children. Now, there are hope. Uh, Darryl, yeah. I agree with Darryl, Darryl but... Darrell has a story to tell, yeah. and he has well, told me just say this. So, yeah. Let me say this. To, let, me, let me respond to Darrell's uh, comment. When hasn't there been a conspiracy against the Black community? We've all, we've lived in a conspiracy all of our lives. So we've got to do what we need to do to counteract that. And we have to continue to fight, 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 fight. You know, I told you, you all before, I'm a old Mississippi civil rights foot soldier. And fighting is something I wake up to do. But there's also a thing called rules of engagement. And I know how to engage. Because I don't want to fight to a point where we're just fighting. I want to fight in a manner that we are acquiring what we need for our kids. That's a good point, And that's a good place for us to say, wait, time and Ruth, and I'm sorry, uh, I almost called you Dr. Ruth again. <laughs> Miss Lynch, it's, it's yes. always. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you. you know, and, well, thank and, and you. So, so, you know, I'm serious. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. I, I I appreciate the history that you bring and the substance that you bring from that history that we need to be aware of. So, and let me just uh, say this before I leave. Mm -hmm. As I always say, if you want the truth, you vote for Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Never would I. Oh, okay. Okay. So let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Ruth, you got, you got, I, that's a good close. Mark. I don't think you, you got it with that one. So trust me, I'm Ruth, always going to tell you my truth, okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. But thank you guys. I really appreciate you having me on. And I'm going to invite you all to, to my um, uh, meeting. meeting. And my fundraiser at, at, at Smitty's on October the 4th. And I have to say it's the compliments of us, uh, former Senator Chris Smith. Okay? Yeah, and, 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 and Ruth, like, I'll say this, not just to anybody. The fact that you're supporting black business, that means a lot. You know, so that, that, that I would hope that, that people would uh, uh, take a look at that and follow you uh, and follow others who have done that. Because they're, they're, it, we do need to support each other. So, thank you. Yes. Eric? 
Uh, on that no, it's been a great night. Uh, yeah, it has. And bring her back. Bring back Dr. Shaw. Is that her name, Dr. Shaw? Mm -hmm. Dr. Shaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, bring her back. We okay. can't talk about mental health enough, especially in our community. Right. And so th again, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And be good and blessings to all. Okay. All right. All right. And we'll be right, right there. Okay. Always in on the all right, if, and I want to say this. Uh, we got some, some upcoming shows people have confirmed. I want to say thank you to Senator Sherman Jones. Uh, Sherman will be our guest on October the 21st. Uh, we're going we're gonna to chop up with him. And we have District, uh, uh, that would be District 3 candidates for the city of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Ms. Pam Pittman has agreed to join us. Uh, so has Dr. Nadine Hankinson, uh, and that's on October the 13th. So we're asking uh, those of you who perhaps know who's campaigning or has an issue, uh, bring it to us and let's discuss it. Because after all, as you can see, I got new better. The West Side Gazette is deeply rooted and we will not be moved. Uh, thank you so very much to our, to our guests and to our audience. Please. Uh, you got something to say? Come on, bring it up. It's a two minute one. And let's deal with it. Right? That's right. Perry? We good. All right. Oh, yes. This is extremely important. Our student athlete of the week, right. Mr. Jaden. Oh, help me pronounce that name. Alvarenga. 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 Congratulations, Jaden. Keep it up, man. Congratulations, Jay. Yeah, he's a running back at, uh, what's that? Shana Madonna. Shana Madonna. Okay. All right, keep it up. And to you parents, if you got a student athlete, please submit it to Mr. Noonan Robinson. For you, for you who don't know Mr. Robinson, one of uh, Brown County's outstanding coaches and, he, and an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so he writes some good stuff. Ready to uh, yes, like great art. Yeah, absolutely. So, but good night, everybody. Uh, God bless. And let's get out to vote. All right? Please. Let's get out.